Well, welcome to Chino y Chicano. I'm Matt Chan, the Chino. And I'm Enrique Cerna, the Chicano. And welcome to Seattle Police Chief Adrian Diaz. This has been one heck of a summer so far. As you look at the way violence and crime has been happening in the city, did you expect it to be as bad as it has been? You know, and actually, as we led up to the summer, I was not expecting to see some of the violence and some of the individual cases that really created a lot of trauma in our community. So the fourth of Lenora case where somebody, you know, randomly comes up to a vehicle and shoots and kills a mom and her unborn child. And that type of violence is, is you just don't see very often. And we saw a lot of shootings that had led up, uh, you know, prior to that. And, um, you know, right away, uh, it just shortly after that, we had another homicide around 137th and Aurora. And I knew I had to change some some model of, of doing something different than we had done uh, in the past. And that's the reason why I set up the Community Violence Task Force, because as we led into the summer, it was very concerning with some of the violence that was occurring. How do you even go about predicting, you know, acts of violence like that? I mean, is, are there trends? Are there tendencies? I mean, how do you even prepare for something like that? Well, each community has its own different dynamics. So that's one of the reasons why I picked four different communities on this community violence task force. It was very specific to Aurora in the central district, in the downtown core uh, that included the CID in Little Saigon, as well as the South End. Each has its, it has a different dynamic. If you look at the CID in the South and, and downtown, you have homeless encampments that are uh, that occupy space. Uh, you have just more rapid use of drug usage. Up on Aurora, you might have human trafficking and sometimes pimps that are involved in a level of violence. The Central District has a different dynamic as well. We saw shootings at the very end of uh, Garfield school year mm, and yeah. around the campus. And then and the South End has... Has had has a different level of violence. Sometimes it's gang related. Sometimes it's you know due to drugs, and sometimes it's drive by shootings. Or sometimes it's just random levels of violence. And so and you're trying to figure out. You know, I think as you kind of mentioned this level, you, is if it's very difficult to really predict a level of violence. Like some of the homicides that we've had this year, or shootings that we've had this year, it's domestic violence. And and people can say, well, you can predict some of that because you can see a propensity for violence that occurs in a home. And sometimes that violence escalates, <clears throat> but you're never going to see it like you might address it through an arrest, but you're never going to know when it's going to actually ha happen into a homicide. Well, some of this other violence that happens in the community is a little bit more unpredictable when you have sometimes people like in homeless encampments and they're occupying space. They really don't know what their space is and, and they encroach another space and that creates conflict and that creates sometimes shootings. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very hard. <clears throat> but what we do is really as we look at trends and you know, we're looking at, you know, some of the activity that's occurring. And we I, I go through some of these areas every single day and just see, OK, there's a lot of people out and they just, <clears throat> they're starting out at five o'clock in the morning. If they start out at five o'clock in the morning, by the time five o'clock in the evening ha happens, you're going to have a stabbing or you're going to have a shooting because it's so long of a day to have conflict. Um, so those are the things that we're, we we get our input from our officers on the street. We get input from our analytics um, and we're taking input from a variety of different sources. But we also uh, look at what we do is similar to a social network analysis. Not everyone is willing to pull a trigger. <clears throat> you know, human nature is, you know, really to love thy neighbor. And so you don't really see people just wanting to go out and hurt and harm others. But we do have people that are are violent in nature. And so you really have to look at when one person's at a shooting, sometimes at our second shooting. And then you start to look at all the people associated with that person and because they're they have a propensity to potentially be eventually suspects in, in cases. And so and we look at it from a kind of a social network analysis, really allowing us to target the effort rather than just saying we're going to randomly enforce law in this very specific area. You know, people feel unsafe on the streets, but it, are they truly unsafe? Because most of the violence happens in, like you say, clusters. So it's not like just random citizens, you know, encountering violent situations. It's usually a cluster of, of incidents and kind of a smaller community-based thing. Is, is that true? So in the essence of 
overall safety, it's actually pretty safe. But in these intersections. Yeah, you know, I would I would agree with that that statement because most of the people that are victim of a crime in a homicide type of situation typically know the person that that is actually harming them or that there's some sort of conflict or some sort of connection. It was targeted. It was the 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 level of violence. DV is a, a great example, right? You know, you know who the person that's going to harm you. You have and sometimes in these situations where you have conflict between gangs, you have one group that's going to fight another group. Again, that conflict. You have sometimes pimps that are trying to, you know, create a territorial area around human trafficking and around Aurora. They're fighting with each other because they want to establish that very specific area. So it it typically doesn't affect the general public. However, we have seen cases that kind of shock the conscience. I mean, it's not just kind of, they shock the conscience. You have the fourth Lenora case. We mm. have others that are, you know, just the, 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 the shooting that happened just the other day with a Lyft driver. We've had one, uh, uh, you know, an Uber driver last year that was, you know, shot and killed uh, <clears throat> that appears to be more random. So you do occasionally see those random acts of violence, but not, that isn't usually a product of all of our violent crime. And then you have what happened in the Rainier Valley at the community center there where an event was happening. You were down there, weren't you? Yeah. So I, well, I wasn't down there for the event. I actually came down there, you know, when the shooting, after the shooting happened, but you know, a lot of the people that were trying to just host a community event, trying to engage youth, trying to provide resources. I worked along with them for, you know, a number of years throughout, you know, pretty much just around 2004 in my career. And so those organizations are really trying to make a difference and trying to reduce violence. And for somebody to come in and target that area and shoot the amount of rounds that they did, I mean, we're not talking about just, you know, five or 10 rounds. We're talking about dozens and dozens of shooting or shots fired in that incident. And we had four victims. I should say five victims in that in that case. So it was purposeful. Is, they shot it at that at that event. So two people ran, you know, came up to that to the side of that event and shot into the crowd. Ugh. You know, they might have, you know, and we we believe that they were focused on one person, but they were willing to disregard life and shoot and end up hit, hitting and harming four other people. But they just it's not just four other people, they harm the community. Mm-hmm. I mean, they created trauma. Like I I heard from community residents, I was in a community meeting with 100 people and they all had that same expression of just kind of shock disbelief and trauma but also like being sick and tired of this type of violence and saying when is it going to stop one thing that i think you have talked about is that you mentioned the firepower the type of weapons being used and the amount of rounds being shot i mean where are they getting these guns and the ammunition all of this stuff uh that's got to be tremendously scary, even more so for the community. Yeah, you know, we have, we've been collecting a lot of what we call 50 round drum magazines. So 50 <laughs> round, wow. 50 round. So it's, it looks like a little Tommy gun. Um, uh, the magazine has uh, the ability to have 50 rounds that are uh, in inside this magazine. <laughs> and then when you buy, you can buy an adjustment to your hand, to a handgun where it makes an automatic uh, uh, handgun, where once you pull that trigger, it's going to cycle through, pull another, it'll pull another round, and pull another round, and pull another round. It's not as fast as an automatic rifle, but <laughs> the damage is still occurring every single round, and it's not making you have to pull the trigger uh, every single time. So it shoots like an automatic gun. And so when you're in a, in a within less than a minute, you're going through fifty rounds. And that's it's not like people are running, people are trying to get away from the situation. It's chaos. And and so we've been collecting more and more of those 50 round drum magazines. And, you know, we've actually seen a lot of rifles. I think there was over a hundred rifles that we've recovered uh, this year alone. Uh, assault rifle, assault type rifles. Well, or just all sorts. Of, I should say a variety of different uh, rifles. Mm-hmm. Some are bolt action rifles and some are assault rifles. And so you do run the gamut, but you know, with rifles, you have a, a bigger round that creates more destruction, can go through more places. Um, well, and so you, they, those can go for a mile or more and still be lethal, right? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, and once a shooting happens, like those rounds, whatever comes up, 
must come down. And so to the, your point, yeah, I mean, this is, and they can be lethal at all. I think we end up having one uh, shooting and I, I don't know all the specifics, but I believe, and there was belief that the shooting occurred about a block and a half away. And, but somebody was hit with a stray round. You know, the, the, the Rainier beach Safeway shooting, how do you, I mean, how does South Seattle protect themselves? I mean, if, if that's even the appropriate word, I mean, how do you prepare for that level of violence that is either targeted or, or random, but it's still, the end result is the same, you know, it's violence. Well, and that's what makes it, that shooting so hard is because they did everything that they're supposed to do. They're trying to get, you know, people and services and they're trying to feed people and they're trying to like and get connected so people feel like they're part of the community. So they're hosting a community event. And we actually were in that area in the parking lot just two minutes prior to the shooting. And we drove around to go to Atlantic Street Boat Ramp, which has had another number of shootings in that in that area. And we could hear the rounds going off when when the shooting occurred. And then we're having to go back, you know, to the shooting. So even we even that event, we had a, a actual presence at that event. And the events going on, trying to help people, and then people just targeted. And that I think and that goes into making sure that the people that are doing this kind of harm and damage, those we want those people in custody. We want to find and identify those people. They have no regard for life. And I'm sorry, but like <clears throat> that's where we need that's where and that jail is something that has to happen. But we've got to be able to identify who those people are. Is this gang related uh do you have any sense of who the people are involved and what's going on here we've had in the south end we've we've actually seen some of the gangs that have been fighting and having uh some level altercations involved in shootings uh, we've you know recovered a number of guns from these locations number of those guns that have been used in two or three other or four more cases um, so a lot of the guns that were recovered, we're covering about 30% of all of the guns that we recovered are actually being used in two cases or more. Wow. Um, and so that, in that shooting, you know, it could be a shooting that happened here in Seattle and it could be a shooting that happened in Kent. It could be a shooting that happened in Tukwila, but those, what we do is we test every round and every gun and to determine it's been used in other cases, not just in our state, but even including Oregon as well. Um, and, and so we found guns that literally have been recovered that have been used in Portland cases as well. So we try to use the technology to be able to kind of identify because some of the many, many of those guns that are shot, it's kind of like has their own imprint of like DNA. And so that allows us to be able to track where those guns are coming from. So there's, so there's like a whole different stream of illicit firearms that are generally used in these types of things where other firearms that are purchased are just kind of used recreationally and whatever people do, but the ones that are used in violent crime seem to have, kind of have their own market, their own stream of kind of circulation. Well, you know, once the once it's in the in in the market of like for, you know, some of this activity, some of the gang activity, or some of this, you know, drive by shootings and stuff, and all that activity, those guns, you know, could be stolen guns. Many of them are stolen guns. In fact, just the other day, I was out. Officer made a stop on a vehicle. I, I backed and supported that officer. We recovered two guns and both of them were scratched out, stolen guns. So, you know, that is what we're seeing on the street is a lot of stolen guns. We're seeing more and more guns right now, this year alone, we recovered over 730 some guns. And Jeez. that is that is the most guns that we've ever recovered the year to date. So, and we've actually almost surpassed some years the total amount of guns that we recovered in the whole year um, since we've been tracking this. And so we're already uh, just in the first seven months. I mean, we're just seeing so much out there. And I always tell people two things. One, it's great work by our officers. They're going out, they're being proactive. They're trying to make sure they make this community safe. They're recovering guns. The second is we're doing it with about 360 less officers. And that's concerning that we're recovering more guns. That just tells you how many guns are out there. You is, know, <laughs> go ahead. In, in South Seattle, I mean, the problem is endemic. Um, 
you know, you've got your officers on the on the ground. I mean, their boots on the ground. They they talk to the people. They see what's going on. What do they? I mean, a lot of the the political kind of class has a lot of always has a lot of words and a lot of buzzwords about you know how they would solve things from from a street perspective from the officers what are they hearing what do people want to have happen is it that because idle hands the kids don't have enough to do is it just the uh employment rates what is sort of the environment that's causing a lot of this is it just idle time for kids to go create mischief or what is it or summer you know, the fact that it's summer summer yeah you know summer is, plays a big role we always see an uptick in summer um but i tell you you know doing this work since you know around 2004 in south park you know you want to keep a kid busy from when they wake up till until they go to sleep you want to make them so tired that they're not thinking about doing something bad and, and mischievous um, and that's, you know, that's being actively engaged in school, after school activities, sports, whatever, whatever makes them enjoy that. And so I think that's a product of, you know, at least for my culture, like, you know, growing up, like my, my parents were like, you're going to play sports and you're going to do this and you're going to be active. And, um, and they were, they were actively engaged in making sure that I had something to do, but by the time I was, I went to bed, like I wasn't thinking about doing, you know, anything else. And so and that's a huge positive gain for people to keep people on the right path. And is that message don't, being heard? The, it, is that message being heard by the city? I mean, I, I think so. I mean, we're creating a lot of investments in the city to a lot of these organizations that want to engage youth, engage people in the right manner. Um, I, I think that COVID also has done a number on our youth too. I mean, you know, for many years, you know, many of them weren't getting a lot of services. They weren't getting connected. They didn't have that daily connection to school and teachers. And many of the organizations were having to do teleservicing. Um, so, you know, they weren't actively creating the mentorship program. They didn't have somebody checking in on them on a daily basis. And if they did, it, it was virtual. Or for many of these youth, that virtual system isn't something that they're that they're going to like, oh, hey, I checked in, I called them, I talked to them for about a minute or two. I'm good. We're, we're good. And we, you know, we go on our way. And I look at it as, you know, when my youth are, or when my kids are, are growing up in just the last couple of years, the one avenue, like I always try to avoid them from, you know, playing a bunch of video games. And, but honestly, the last couple of years, that was the only way that they actually could spend time with their friends. Mm -hmm. And so, now they're sitting there like enthralled into video games. And if they're not in the right video games, it's, you know, the call of duty or the shooting ones, like that's what they're seeing every single day for hours on end. And, and so there's a level of violence. that's not, you know, that that could be caused in that <clears throat> if they're not engaged in, in pro-social activities, like, you know, my kids, I, we made a point to like, say, you're going to do soccer and, and football and baseball and, and, you know, they their their programs were able to work out small groups and do adjustments to, you know, so that way they could actually, be, you know, do stuff. Um, but that's not what every kid gets. Many schools were behind in the times of getting them computers to get them access to education. And so all of that, I think, has played a role that we're not going to see the full effects of COVID from even in more, you know, many more years. This is just on the front end. We're seeing some of the effects right now, but I don't think we're seeing the full effects uh, to this to to how the pandemic has actually changed our our communities. How would you say downtown Seattle is doing? There are some that are going to say, "Boy, just stay away," because it's right. not not a safe place. You know, it's sad to see the downtown the way it looks. I mean, you have many businesses that have boarded up; they're not operating you know, good restaurants, the the vibrancy, but that's what we're all trying to bring back. You know, the, the mayor's office has <laughs> created the downtown action plan. That, um, we're trying to get businesses, you know, functional, being able to use space, being able to access that kind of stuff. You know, the city or the mayor's office put the ordinance for drug usage uh, in front of the city council, because really right now we've seen the things that people feel so unsafe is when people are in behavioral crisis and people are in smoking fentanyl. And I've been raising that concern about fentanyl usage for a long time. 
Now, we don't have the capacity to go out and make every arrest for people that are, are using fentanyl. But we have to be able to change behavior and we have to get people into services. We have to think about taking a compassionate approach to have a health-based strategy. And but we also have to hold people accountable sometimes when they're <laughs> when they're causing problems. And I think that the the legislation that the mayor's office has put forward has has created that balance. Um and I'm hoping that, you know, as we move forward, that this city comes back into that level of being a safer city. I feel <clears throat> just from the year before, we had a whole lot more violence in the downtown core. And <clears throat> we're seeing that violence drop down drastically. I mean, close to 30, 40% reduction in shootings and shots fired. And so we're seeing things that are, 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 are actually tailoring into the right direction. But there's still more to do. And that's that's what we're trying to you know get across is that we want people to come in and, and, and shop. We want people to come and visit Pike Place Market. We wanted people to come into our shopping district. <clears throat> you got to also think about within the next year or two, that convention center is going to be used at full capacity. And there are 7,000 hotel rooms in and around that <clears throat> convention center that are going to be used. Like there's going to be a lot of shopping. There's going to be a lot of ability for that downtown to be revitalized. World Cup is going to come in in 2026. You know, each game close comes close to $50 million in tax revenue. And so you're going to start to see this downtown kind of be reinvigorated as well um, and that I'm excited for. But right now it's really taking the time and investments to get it, get it done right now. So now, I looked at like some statistics about Seattle and the crime rate, 134% higher than the national average. Wow. Those are, I, I don't know where the, I don't know those crimes you know, <laughs> stats. I, I know that last year was our highest crime rate uh, and, and we were 4% over the year before, which meant that that was an increase as well. And this year alone, we've actually seen a 16% reduction, but 13% in violent crime reduction overall. So, but that's compared to last year, which was our highest year. So we're, so we are starting to trend in the right direction. Uh, just in the last 28 days, we've actually seen a 34% reduction in shots fired. Um, so that's a good thing. So typically when during the summer, you would actually see shots fired go up. We're actually starting to finally get, maybe after some good arrest and, and good, you know, good, some of the good police work that we're finally seeing that uh, actually uh, be reduced. But when you have two cases that had the Capitol Hill where you had four people shot, one dead, and you had the, you know, um, the Rainier Beach where five people were shot, people were going to feel unsafe. It, I can say I can say all these stats about it all the time. It ain't going to matter. People are going to feel unsafe. So it's about earning people's trust back to making areas feel safe again. And that's it's all of our responsibility. It's not just the police. But as our community come out and say, look, we're going to be out here, we're going to be a visible presence, <laughs> we're going to not let this deter us, and we're going to go out and, and try to get people to be healthy. And that's what we're trying to do right now. You know, to that point, 12th and Jackson, 12th and King, and it just never ends. I mean, yeah. what is it about that area that is so attractive that, that it becomes this hub for all the open air drug dealing, the stolen goods market. I mean, it's like a bazaar there every day. I mean, I go through there every day and I, it moves from one corner to another, but it never goes away. What is it about? Is it a geographic location? Is it because of the transit hub? What are the factors that make this place so attractive to this kind of activity? Well, when I was in patrol, I don't remember it ever being <clears throat> the way it looks like. Right no, now. I don't remember that. Yeah. And so <clears throat> you have a lot of factors. You have the navigation center <clears throat> that people are hanging out in and around the building. You have Jose Rizal Hillside, which is uh, kind of that 10th and Lane uh, area, which has had huge encampments. You have the other side, the north side, which has been the stairway, or not the north side, the east side of it. You've also had people that have been impacted by COVID and <clears throat> they're they're trying to purchase things at a much cheaper cost. Mm -hmm. So you have sometimes residents that are actually purchasing oh, items. Oh, yes. And, and people know it. People in the community are like, 
so and so, you know, this female or this this male, they know who the people are that are regularly purchasing stuff. So you have that impact. So right now we're going to be posting, we're, we're creating these signs that basically says that it's illegal to buy stolen merchandise. <clears throat> and we're going to do it in different languages, but that is one of the things that we're, you know, trying to educate people so that way they're not becoming a feeder of this activity. And people are going to come where the business is, right? Yeah. So if people are stealing items, <clears throat> where, where are people purchasing it? They're purchasing in this area. It's going to become an area where where they go. And yeah. that's where we've got to stop. We've got to break that cycle. So that's going to be tough, though, Chief, because, you know, the people are in subsistence living wages in Chinatown area. And, man, if you can go get a, a tube of toothpaste for 25 cents, you're going to do it, regardless if it's yeah. stolen or not, because, you know, you're stretching every penny. That's just, God, what a toxic mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Chief, I wanted to talk to you about uh, your own set up there, your management team. I think the yeah. last time we talked to you, you you still were in the process of trying to implement, I guess, your people. So what's happened there and how has that gone? Uh, because change is never easy and not everybody likes it. No, and, and that that I found out, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, part of that is, is I had to make change. So when I, the first couple of years of my tenure, I kept, pretty much everything, you know, going and functioning the way it was. We lost, you know, 600 personnel. Um, and, and you know, we kind of downsized things. We kind of adjusted things. But really, when I became chief, I really wanted to put, kind of get my team in place. People that, you know, are are focused on what my mission is and my vision is and and really be able to move the department forward. I had to downsize, you know, a bureau because it didn't make any sense with the amount of loss of officers that we had to, you know, have the amount of people in our, in our, uh, or how many, I mean, kind of be a top heavy department and went through, you know, a variety of, uh, a, a deputy chief process, an assistant chief process, uh, end up, you know, getting our command staff, uh, organized. I also then made a bunch of, you know, uh, transfers in around the captains and lieutenants. We've made it a, a wide scale promotion in lieutenants because we were down. We hadn't promoted a lieutenant in close to about nine months. <clears throat> so really try to invigorate this level of energy. And, and some people are on board. They're they're excited about the energy. They're excited about taking on new work. And some people that <clears throat> maybe have had done work uh, in their job and gotten comfortable with that work, get moved to somewhere else and that creates change and they might not like it. And so you know, you have angst, you have, you know, uh, functions, but right now for me, it's about moving the department forward um, and really creating a vision of making sure our officers are focused on doing the right thing and helping others and being compassionate about making sure that we're trying to make the community as safe as possible and recovering guns and, you know, <clears throat> revamping every aspect of what we do. Two and a half years when I when I took over, you know, two and a half years ago, or three actually it's three years almost to the date. August twelfth was the date I took over three years ago. <clears throat> we we actually took our our um, thing out of consent decree. We said we're not uh, going to be part. I mean, we're not going to be uh, in compliance with consent decree. So let's just remove our our ability to say that we are. In three years, now we're sitting in front of a judge <clears throat> saying, like we are accomplishing all the goals that you wanted us to accomplish. And so we're, we're working hard for this change. We're working hard to make sure that, you know, you revamp your level of culture. I brought in the SPD before the badge, which is a program six weeks prior to the Academy to infuse people into community and community has been so embraceive of it. They've, they've embraced this. They've enjoyed having conversations with our new recruits, getting to meet them, getting to be exposed to them. <clears throat> but there's more to come. There's more to come. And, you know, for me, it's about, you know, continuing that change, continuing that push. Uh, and not everyone's going to like it. Some are going to be, a, some, some people are going to be completely on board with it. And I think, you know, that is really about what this department is all about, is really about being nimble, really about adjusting. And um, <clears throat> I think we are going to do some great things. And, um, with the team that we have. And, and I, I'm excited for that. How's the recruitment going? 
I mean, are you me meeting your goals or is there a net positive here? Or okay. There's not a net positive. So um they right now we last year we were over 110 people that had left the department. And this year we have about 65. So we're you know, we're actually retaining people at a at a better rate. So that's a good thing. <clears throat> we our hiring was about half of the people that we hired this year so far. So we're our hiring is getting better. So we're finally starting to close the gap on the amount of people that are uh, that net that net negative. <laughs> we're actually finally getting closer to being neutral. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, I think that that is positive, but we have to do more recruiting. We have to do more and getting information out about what this agency is doing, how people can help us out, how people can serve. And that is going to be, you know, we're going to be launching a variety of different ads. We're working with the mayor's office, working with, a, a you know, a, an organization that's going to focus on recruiting and hiring uh, <laughs> that the city has brought on. So I'm excited for that. I'm really excited for that time. There was um, a, a retired officer or, or an officer that is now retired that went on a local radio program that uh, bashed the mayor, really criticized you. How do you respond to something like that, particularly as you're trying to get people to come into the Seattle Police Department? Yeah, you know, I, when it comes to sometimes, you know, people have left for a variety of different reasons. Some are good, some are bad. So I really can't speak to to her experience to that. All I can, you know, go is focuses on what we're trying to do to move this department forward. We're trying to hire 1,400 officers. We're trying to, you know, change every aspect of this. We've managed to get not in compliance with the consent decree and to now be in front of the judge saying we've accomplished everything that you've asked. And now, not just from that point, now it's like and we went almost about 13 months without an officer involved shooting. That is you know, unheard of. So officers are using less force. They're having less complaints. They're recovering more guns. You know, those are things that, you know, make a difference in the community. And, you know, that's what we're doing right now. That is those hard work of our officers on, a, on an everyday basis. They're doing it. And I have the privilege of leading us through that process. You know, sometimes or not, everyone's going to always agree with me. But my job is really to make sure that this department is very responsive to the community's needs. And I feel like right now we're we're making some huge inroads and we're doing some really, really good work. And that's what we're going to do. It seems like you have a tremendous <laughs> balancing act here because yeah. of the shortage of officers and yet the crime that is happening, you know, throughout the city in different pockets and different places that make it tough along with the gun violence, which really, I think, just scares the hell out of everybody. No, oh, and, it, you know, honestly, it makes it very difficult for the officers. The officers are working so many long hours. They're, they're working hard because they don't have as many officers. They're trolls trying to make the community safe. And you know what? They're doing it. I mean, we're seeing a 13% reduction in violent crime. That's a huge, I mean, to see an 8% reduction in shots fired, you know, throughout for the whole year, but even just having that 34% reduction over the last 28 days. I mean, <clears throat> that's hard, hard work. And they're doing it, working, having to work longer and longer hours every single day, sometimes double shifts, and <clears throat> sometimes not only just... Their shifts, but they're working special events. They're working, you know, <clears throat> anything from Mariners games to concerts. We now we're coming into Seahawks. You know, when you and say so I, there's there's <clears throat> been a reduction, how is that occurring? Is it just because of the presence uh, of the police, or I mean, what are some of the things that are helping to mitigate this? I'm, I'm sorry, reduction of of personnel. You know, yeah, no, no. When you say that, you know, uh, violent crimes have dropped. Um, you, you know, how is that? You, what is the reason it's dropping? Is it because of better presence, <laughs> um, more ubiquitousness in and understanding patterns and stuff? I mean, what is the I mechanism? Think, I think it's actually coming down to very specific arrests. Mm -hmm. And when you think about crime, and <clears throat> not everyone's committing crime, right? You have sometimes one person can commit 80 different crimes. When somebody does a burglary, they're not that isn't their only burglary. There's probably already five or ten behind them. If they're doing a car prowl, there isn't just one car prowl. They're doing probably five to 10, if not more, beyond them. Auto theft is another one. Typically, auto theft might not get charged after until they get seven or six or seven cases under them. Many of these situations, you have a person that's already high, a high utilizer of the system. 
And if you're making those arrests, you're actually, you know, saving a lot of crime from actually happening. And I think that's really what we're focused on. Okay. And we made a, a, a specific arrest just within the last couple of weeks and our shots fired has dropped drastically just off one arrest. And I think it goes down to that. That's the reason why getting the people that are high utilizers of our system that really are the ones doing those crimes can make a huge significant impact in reduction of, of very specific crime uh, crimes. You've had to become a lot smarter about how you go about policing and that's yeah, yielding you know, results. We, and actually we look at it a five-step approach. We look at community. So you look at violence interrupters. Uh, so you look at, you know, how does community play a role in, in trying to be more responsive to, to addressing violent uh, issues? And you have analytics. So that is looking at crime data, looking at crime trends, looking at certain specific people, identifying those specific people. You look at prevention. So we have extreme risk protection orders where just the other day we end up recovering 17 guns out of an extreme risk protection order because those guns could easily be have been used out in the community. And you look at uh, environment. So like, how do we light up an area? How do we create an environment where people start walking around and it becomes a safer area? And then you look at a very specific levels of enforcement. So we, I refer to it as CAPE, but that is really our, our violent crime strategy, community analytics, prevention, environment, enforcement. And, and it, it, each of those has, has a role to be able to play in, in the reduction of, of our overall violent crime. Everybody's into analytics these days <laughs> in every, every walk of life. They truly are. So yeah, yeah it's how you look at it. Well, um, okay. So it's, you know, I'm going to ask you this question, but it's been eight years since Donnie Chin was murdered in the CID. And <laughs> still, I mean, at what point does it become a cold case? Um, is it still an active case? I mean, it is an active case. It is an active case. And that is, you know, those are such tragic cases uh, you know, I think, you know, I actually saw uh, um, uh, Miss Chin at the Night Out Against Crime, mm -hmm. talked to her for a little bit of time. Um, <clears throat> but those are th those are that is still an active case. Uh, typically, when it becomes a cold case is when those detectives retire um, from that case and they don't turn it over to a new detective. Then it goes and uh, ends up going into a cold case uh, system um, because those detectives are really they. They know what's going on. They know what's, you know, what they've interviewed people. They kind of have an idea. So you don't want to give those cases up to another detective. But one, one of the things that we're looking at doing is actually taking a detective or taking a person into that wants to eventually join the homicide unit and making them kind of a reviewer of cases that have gone uh, stale and, and where we haven't got a lot of information taking a good quick look at it, a review of it to see, is there something that we might be missing? And it just puts new eyes on it. And so that's one of the things that we're doing. Even in the midst of, of kind of the staffing challenge, we want to make sure that we're being re more responsive uh, to the communities, the victims' needs, the victims' families. Um, and so that's one of the things that that we're looking at moving forward soon on. Yeah. One <laughs> last thing before we go, I wanted to ask. Um, go ahead, Matt. You wanted to No, but it's been eight years. And I'm just wondering... Any breaks? I mean, is there anything new that you've learned over the eight years? At this time right now, no. And I mm -hmm. and I can't, and I'm and I'm, you know, also gonna be in communication with with Ms. Chin as well. But um <clears throat> there's there's really this is where we ask a lot of the community, is there somebody that has something else? That doesn't mean that our detectives don't <clears throat> have a good idea of of potential people that were in and around that area. And the problem is, is trying to also prove those things. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a difference of, of being able to uh, look at these cases. And I'm not saying in this case alone, but you're looking at sometimes these cases and you're trying to figure out how do you, how do you get it through a prosecutor to actually be able to prove this case? And that is a struggle. Sometimes you have people that are talking about, you know, <clears throat> so-and-so was involved in this area and they were active in this area and you know, <clears throat> And you start to kind of have a little bit of information, but you sometimes just don't have enough uh, to meet the formal. And that's that's some of the struggles with many of these cases that sometimes go stale is that you need people to come forward to be able to say, yes, I saw so and so did it. And that actually can sometimes be in alignment with what we're hearing. But it's just getting people to actually say, yes, I saw something. Evidence. 
something that's beyond just something that's circumstantial. Uh, yeah. Last question here before we go. The recruiting efforts. How, what are you doing? How do you do it? How do you try to get people to say, come on, be a police officer, join the Seattle yeah. police? You know, I think really it's about trying to make sure that people know that this job is about about service and about helping others. And I think I've kind of mentioned it, you know, maybe not here, but as I mentioned, I talk about it quite a bit. You know, people, our younger generation wants to help people. They want to serve people. They want to do good for, for others. But sometimes they don't see police as that service job. And we've got to make the people understand that this is about service. It is about helping out. So one of the things that we're <clears throat> launching out is, and one of the new initiatives that we're we're going to be doing more, and people have, might have already seen some of this stuff, we're actually releasing more body camera videos of our work. So at the Rainier Beach shooting, we had one of our officers who was an EMT trained and was literally going from shooting victim to shooting victim, <clears throat> just literally talking people through one of the most traumatic situations that they've ever dealt with, you know, being shot and helping them out, going through and treating them. <clears throat> but we're actually showing some of our foot pursuits, some of our different activity that our officers are, are undergoing to de-escalate situations. We're going to be highlighting more and more of that work. And that's really kind of to show also part of that recruiting effort. Show us, hey, look, you can actually do this job. You can de-escalate a situation and be, be able to help somebody not commit suicide, or you could help somebody <clears throat> through a rough time in their in their life. You can actually save somebody's life by, you know, <clears throat> treating people for their injuries. You could, there's a variety of different things, and we really just have to make sure that people know uh, <clears throat> all of the hard work that our officers are doing. All right, Seattle Police Chief Adrian Diaz, thanks again for uh, yeah. It's always a pleasure. To have yeah, you always on. a pleasure. To, and uh, taking all our questions, we always have lots of questions. <laughs> uh, so thanks again for being here, and uh, come back in a in a couple of months or so, so we can uh, ask you all a bunch of questions again. Okay, <laughs> I, I'll be on board. I'll all right. On. Hey, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank care. you. All thank right. You. Stay safe out there. <laughs> we'll do. It.